Welcome to the Movies to Watch Before You Die podcast. My name is Gab, and I am here with my co-host and cousin. Dylan. And today we have a very special guest because we are watching or, or discussing... Oh, boy, I've already messed it up. Should we start again or should I just let it rock? We're discussing how we watched. <laughs> <laughs> We're discussing a movie that we chose to watch because it was one that uh, Corey had never seen. And it felt like a, a crime punishable by electric chair that he had never seen this movie. Um, so without further ado, Corey, what movie are we here to discuss? Biggie. Biggie. It's about Biggie. <laughs> <laughs> what is the reference you're making? I'm just thinking of the old Wendy song. What say? What did you feel? She says, Larissa. Oh. Have, it's been too long since I've seen that. Boys against the queen will die. Yes. You know, she wanted a house more biggie. <laughs> <laughs> we are discussing, for those who don't know 90 Day Fiance, don't give a shit. We are discussing the Tom Hanks classic film, Big. <laughs> Way to make a meal out of that word. <laughs> okay. So, Gab, very quickly, why are the people listening to us talk about Big? Well, first of all, we've done over a year's worth of this, so we're experts. Um, we both have backgrounds in film and multimedia. You as a film editor uh, who went to film school, me as an actor who went to acting school. And uh, we just really love talking to each other about movies. So we figured we'd make you listen to it. Yep. Sounds about right. And yep. should we have Corey tell us what is Big about? What's this all been about? What am I working toward? You think you know everything about me, don't you? I die, but you're bottom. I bloody well ought to. Here we go. I'm going to try. I'm, I'm not usually good at this because I'm so long-winded, but... Just know, Corey, that if you do not match the IMDb plot summary, we're going to throw you off. All right. Hold on a second. Big is about a little kid who uh, he likes a girl at school, and they go to a fair, him and his family, one time. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me start over. Big is about a little kid who who thinks that the grass is greener on the other side of being an adult versus being just a kid his own age. Oh, wow. So, okay. So you went from like way over <laughs> to like, here is the one sentence log line. Okay. Yeah, wait. And there's a guy named Vinny. <laughs> wait. Oh. <laughs> Um, okay. Let's get he went the from possibly. scene by scene to <laughs> this is like the moral of the story. Yeah, he went from 40 minute explanation to like 40 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. The IMDb plot summary of Big is after wishing to be made big, a teenage boy wakes the next morning to find himself mysteriously in the body of an adult. Yeah, that's what that's about. Pause before we go on. Let me tell you a little bit about the movie that we watched last night that wasn't for this podcast. I just want to briefly go over this because it's a movie I think we brought up on the podcast that I had never seen. Are you ready for this? Corey's mom came over because it was just recently his birthday. Happy birthday, Corey. Happy birthday, Corey. Uh, 34 years old. Good job. You made it. And uh, his mom came over and we had dinner and we watched Little Nicky. Oh, that's... I, I was hoping it was going to be like a big movie that I'd be like, you gotta watch this guy, but it's a little dicky. Did you find out Popeye's chicken is the shit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Popeye's chicken is the shit. And uh, that voice is insufferable. I, I, I looked at him for the first five minutes and I was, out. I was like, is he going to do this the whole movie? And apparently, yes. The answer is yes, he is going to do this the whole movie. That movie, like, that is truly the turning point of Adam Sandler from like, every movie's a banger to like, we're riding a thin line here. Like, yeah. Adam Sandler has a thing where he's just like, yeah, I'm going to do the fuck out of this product placement. You know what I mean? And you're like, that was the last movie where I feel like my brain was like, I can't ignore how prominent this is. And every movie since I'm like, oh, here's the major product placement. Yeah. Well, I was surprised that it came out in 2000 because let's talk about what came before that. But or honestly, what came after? Because Mr. Deeds came after. Mr. Deeds is a great movie. Mr. Deeds is very good. That's also based on a like that's sort of a remake. Okay, either way, it's still good. Um, obviously, Big Daddy is amazing. Fifty First States came after. That's great. Um, uh, Fifty First States is arguably Adam Sandler's best movie. Hey, I think it's Big Daddy. Yeah. I think it's The Wedding Singer. Oh. I fuck yeah. you at The Wedding what Singer. What about The real Water Boy? 
I like the water boy. I don't I don't call it his best, but it's up there. I also love me some Happy Gilmore. Happy Gilmore, Billy Madison. Billy Madison. What about the longest yard? Which not necessarily. I really like the original longest yard. I don't really care for the newer one as much. Uh, you know what? There's a movie on my list that I'd like to do at some point, um, which is an Adam, Adam Sandler, Jennifer Aniston movie. Uh, just go with it, which I think is a great fucking movie. I'm not going to say anything, but I saw that movie in theaters, and Me too. I'm not going to say anything about it. Okay. We love Eight Crazy Nights, another animated one. Oh, and for the Jews out there, uh, there's so rarely like a movie about anything relating to like a Jewish holiday, and I was like, this is the best week out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I guess I keep voice. I guess I. This is the, the best week. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I don't like animated movies, so I I, I don't like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, Little Nicky was was bad. I was expecting it to be a banger. I was like, oh, I've never seen this, and I think it was you who said, "Man, you don't really have to." And I was like, no, everybody loves Little Nicky, but nope, it was bad. Well, he had a Pete Wentz haircut. Yep, and it Pete had Wentz. all types of. It had so many famous people: Quentin Tarantino, Reese Witherspoon. Ozzy Osbourne, Rodney Dangerfield, Apollo Creed. Uh, <laughs> wow, this is a lot of people. Harvey Keitel, uh, all of his his buddies. Patricia Arquette, buddies. Rob Schneider, Patricia Arquette, Ozzy Osbourne. He said that already. Oh, you said that already. <laughs> Patricia oh, Arquette said it already. <laughs> Wait, can we talk about no leniency from Gap? <laughs> she turned to you. He said that. <laughs> <laughs> Um. Yeah. Anyway, Little Nicky, not a great movie. Uh. But I digress. We're here to discuss a different movie that Adam Sandler is not a part of at all, and that is Big. Wait, wait, wait. John Witherspoon. Okay, all right. John Witherspoon, the comedian. You mean Reese Witherspoon. John Witherspoon and Reese Witherspoon were both in that movie. The both of. Are they no really? relation? Oh, one was a black man <laughs> who had a do rag on, <laughs> and the other one is. Weiss Witherspoon. John Witherspoon's the one talking about doing crazy eyes. Weiss Witherspoon. Weiss Witherspoon. Yeah. Weiss Witherspoon. Huh? John Witherspoon's the one in Little Nicky talking about doing the crazy eyes that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it, got it. He played Sean and Marlon's father in the hit show, The Wayne Book. Interesting. Was he in White Chicks? No. Probably. No, he wasn't. I don't, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Also, a movie to watch when you die, in my opinion. All right. Can we talk about <laughs> being. I'm not stopping you. Okay. All right, what's the next thing we do in this? Tag oh, lines. should we go over some taglines? Hit me with them. We got a lot. Oh. Okay. First, you're only young once. Lame. Okay. Remember, dot, 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 when buddies were buddies, girls were a mystery, and you couldn't wait to grow up? I wish it would just say, remember when you couldn't wait to grow up. Yeah, that'd be a lot better. Yeah. Have you ever had a really biggie secret? It's, it says Biggie or... Biggie? No, it just says Big. Okay. <laughs> this, this is the laziest of ones. This is like, maybe it was just on the DVD or something. A wonderful new comedy. Get the fuck out of here. That's it. You're only young once. But for Josh, it might just last a lifetime. I don't see how that's at all... That's implied. sort of the opposite of the movie, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, Josh wanted everything in life. Girls, money, cars. Today, all his wildest dreams have come true. No, they haven't. This is this. This all feels like some guy who was like, we told him what the movie's about, but he never actually watched the movie. And he was like, ah, fuck it. I mean, yeah, he probably wishes for a bunch of shit, not just to be big, right? What kid would just wish to be big? Yeah, honestly, that that man, has, uh, that person who wrote this, has never seen this movie. Either. Corey, do you like any of that person who wrote this has never been a kid before? Oh, yeah, well, maybe that. He was cloned as an adult. Speaking of cloning, have you ever seen the movie The Sixth Day? No. Maybe a movie we do at some point because it's a movie that's so bad it's enjoyable where Arnold Schwarzenegger is cloned and there are multiple scenes of Arnold Schwarzenegger acting with Arnold Schwarzenegger and he's just like, oh my God, you are my clone. How do I know you're not the clone and I'm the clone? And it's just like a lot of that back and forth. <laughs> and he's like, oh we have God. to save our wife and kid. That's scary. It's good stuff. Uh, a movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger is cloned. Isn't that uh, the one with him and Danny DeVito, Twins? Yeah. No, they're actually they're they're separating at birth. Yeah, but they're they look like the same. They're clone. Have you have you seen twins? No. Oh fuck, we gotta do that at some point. But I digress. Yeah, yeah. We have talked about maybe like ten so percent of this episode so far. Okay. We finished the taglines. Is it time to get to our opinions? Well, I mean, maybe do we want to give a little bit more context? 
Corey, now you can go back to your explanation where you were talking about how he likes a girl and the, the more long explanation we can do. Now. All right. So, you know, you got this guy. Um, he played Josh. Forrest Gump. His name's Josh in this movie. <laughs> uh, Tom Hanks has been on in a few of these movies already. Um, hey, Tom Hanks. So, yeah. So he's a kid. He's he's short compared to um, some of the other kids. And he likes this girl. And he goes to the fair with his family. Carnival? Fair with his family. Is a fair and a carnival? I don't think the distinction is very important, but yeah, fair. Wait wait a minute. Is a fair and a carnival, are they two different things? So I'm going to say this at the risk of people from middle America coming after me with their pitchforks that they use regularly, but I believe that a fair is like something that is like the state fair where they have like the the contest of whose pig is cooler. They do like hot dogs and they have like the the Rex Smythe Higgins comes with his boat. (laughs) And and there's... All right. My thinking. Uh, before you tell us the definition, I'm just going to say I think it's a carnival because carnivals have rides. And so, yeah, carnivals are like packed up and and they travel all over the place and and they're from New York and there's no fair in where they're from. First of all, I think they're pretty much synonyms of each other. So they can be the same thing. But from a quick Google, here's what we have. Carnivals are small, often traveling and focus on entertainment. Fairs are larger often community sponsored and feature competitions as well as elements of carnivals. Right, like 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 prize winning pigs. I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, Dylan, do you remember the commercial that would be on We Were Kids where it was like come to the tra- come to the It was the-, the Westchester County Fair? No, for you it was the Westchester County Fair in the Bronx. <laughs> but for us it was come to the Big Spring Fair. Right, which copied our jingle no, from no, the no, Westchester no, no. County Fair. Well, I bet you they did two hundred of those commercials. It was just one guy doing the same jingle like Come to the Kalamazoo Fair. Come to the Westchester yeah, Fair. Everybody, everybody in New York had Uncle Magic. Oh yeah, Uncle Magic. Oh my God. Who was your favorite uncle? Uh, uncle, uncle Magic. Magic. <laughs> and then Uncle Magic proceeds to scream at you for ninety seconds. <laughs> like, hey kids, you like fucking magic? <laughs> I'm gonna do some well, fucking well, no, magic. No, no, no. Is he gonna like? That's, un- that's shock him the clown. Hey, <laughs> very distinct difference. <laughs> Shock in the clown <laughs> who came, made balloon animals, and sold your, your uncle drugs. <laughs> also, bootleg CDs. <laughs> Shock him, why is my balloon filled with powder? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, away, all right. So this kid goes to the carnival with his parents. I think we've decided which, it was a fair, Corey. So it was a fair. No, I, I'll tell you what. They were with the dad... And you never see the father again for the rest of the movie. Number I was one. thinking the same thing. He just disappears Which after that. Blew my mind. So you got this single mom now worried about her kid who disappeared, hold but on. not. All right. All right. Hold on a sec. Okay. So at that the seems fair, like an <laughs> so at the, so at the fair, he goes, he tries to do this thing where he goes over and sees the girl that he likes and uh, she's get, she's in line for a ride and it's, it's, he comes up and he kind of gets like the courage to get next to her. They start chatting a little bit. And then the boy that she's actually hanging out with comes and he's like two feet taller than him. And when they get to the, and he drives and she's like, he drives. And this kid, like I saw him on a skateboard in the beginning of the movie. So she can't get on that with him. Right. So they get to the front of the line. There's this, there's one of these, uh, you got to be this tall to ride this ride things. And he's small. Right. the opposite of big the opposite of big so he can't get on the ride and the guy who's letting people on is a prick about it and he's being real mean to this kid he's like what are you gonna do get the fuck out of here you can't get on the ride and then the kid with his girlfriend now gets on the ride not his they it's he he likes the girl she's getting on the ride with another dude then his parents come it's embarrassing he goes and finds the machine with with a little uh Indian guy named Zoltar. The guy, I don't and, think the guy's Indian. Oh. <laughs> well, he's, you know. <laughs> he, he's wearing a turban. He's wearing a turban. Yeah, it's, making just, it's just because he's a magician type dude. Yeah, but Shaq the Clown didn't wear a turban. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's rocking a turban and uh, he goes, I wish I was big. And then uh, the machine lights up and the mouth opens and but then we realize the machine's... All right, listen, I'm getting too deep into it, but he wakes up big. He can't fit his clothes <laughs> like anymore. like two minutes in and you just got to him getting big. 
Yeah, yeah. He's getting big. He's big now. He wakes up in the house with his mom. There's a baby, no dad. And then he decides- The baby had a dad. The baby's not Jesus, Corey. Well, the ba- the dad let the dad made the baby happen and then disappeared, which is sad. That's what happened in this movie. And then he went, and then he went into New York, stayed in some brothel type hotel, and then, uh, you know, that's that was that was great, babe. <laughs> that was great, babe. So you're anyway, the cane across the deck now, where you get yanked <laughs> off the stage. Your your tight five is over. Um. So anyway, he's he's now finds himself as an adult. He has to navigate the world. People obviously perceive his him as an adult. He feels and acts as if he is still a kid, and he needs to um, find another Zoltar machine to reverse the wish. Um, but in order to do that, he's got to wait two weeks to find out where the closest one is because they put it in order with the directory. Six to eight. So weeks. he's six to eight weeks. Thank you. So he's just been six to eight weeks surviving. He gets a job. He uh, finds himself in some adult situations that he doesn't quite know how to handle. He has a, he earns himself a good living. He does well at work um, as a toy tester. Um, yeah, you're now like the best job ever. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, hilarity ensues, I suppose. But the, the reason that we chose this movie, and this is kind of what I want to get back to, is that we were having a discussion. Corey and I were having a discussion. Um, when you think of Tom Hanks, what character do you think of? And Corey said... Oh, wait, what did I say? Corey said Woody and Forrest Gump. You know, I did say that. You did. And I said, that's interesting because I think of Forrest Gump and Josh from Big. And he kind of just stared at me and I said, oh, no, have you never seen Big? And he was like, I I don't know. And I was like, FAO Schwartz, the piano, Big, the loft. I'm like, I know that scene, but I've never seen the movie. But I, you know what? Even after seeing Big, I'm still going to continue to think of him as Forrest Gump. And, and that's an opinion. And that's really fair, too. Like, I think of him as Forrest Gump. Yeah, because we had the tape. like it was, And it was always on the top of the stack, too. So I would just see Tom Hanks as Forrest Gump. Just him and, sitting on that bench. Well, that sounds like an opinion, so I guess we should uh, mosey on into opinion time. Ooh, smooth segue. Here we go. In this critic's opinion... You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Well, I have a right to my opinion, and my opinion is you have no right to your opinion. The thing that I would like to discuss is kind of the the really big elephant in the room with this movie, especially as we discuss it in today's day and age. And that is... You're going to say? Yeah, his relationship with what's-her-face. Susan. Susan. Susan uh, has a crush on him. Susan seems like the office floozy, uh, the way that they make her out to be. Well, they, um, it's another thing that I feel like wouldn't happen in most movies now. John Lovitz, who I totally forget is in this movie. Yeah. Points out another woman and is like, you say hi, this woman's going to wrap her legs around you, which I do love Josh as a little kid goes, well, I'll stay away from her. But like, <laughs> they make her out to be the office floozy, and I guess they make Susan out to be like the higher executive level floozy. Because yeah. she's, with, um, she's with the other character who's like, He's the father from Home Alone. Yes, the dad from Home Alone. Um, I can't remember his name. Josh Hurd or something like that. I'm getting it wrong. But who he is sort of the foil to Josh in that he's too much of an adult in this job. Josh is too much of a kid. And she very quickly at this party is like, going on with that guy. Peace. Yeah. And, you know, in the beginning, it's kind of like, okay, she doesn't know. He's very innocent. They sleep in different beds. You know, Josh has bunk beds. So she sleeps in the bottom bunk. He sleeps in the top bunk. And she kind of likes that he's innocent and she kind of likes that he's very different from her ex, who, again, is a little bit too serious and adulty. But at some point, she does learn that he is a kid and she kind of has this like, well, I don't want you to go. And it's like he's 14, like he's 13. It, it, he's 13. It it felt. And listen, I'm not like the the, you know, police of things being like moral or politically correct in terms of like films that just came out in a time when we were less sensitive to things like that um as i've stated many times on this podcast before but it does feel like there should have been a flip a switch flipped when she finds out that he's 13 that isn't flipped and instead of being like i'm gonna help you get home to your mom she's like well don't you still want to stay here and be my boyfriend and we can just ignore the fact that you're a little kid i totally disagree with that because i think that there's a large element to which she she totally doesn't believe him when he first says that. Like, she thinks either that he is cheating on her or that he's just, like, afraid of commitment. Uh-huh. And 
when we do finally get to the moment where she realizes like, oh no, he's really a little kid. We can see that change. And there's like something very important that I'll get to when we get to the facts. It's a change that the actress made that I think is also crucial. That's something that happens during like the end of the movie. But I think she acts very differently at the very end. She's like, she definitely starts to treat him more like a kid. And it's never as though she never seems predatory. He's never like, I don't know sex. Like he's never saying things that are like, I'm just a little baby. You know, he's not like saying things like that. He just seems to be to her, this free spirit who is looking at life in a more refreshed way than these adults who are way too uptight are. And I think while watching the movie, you're not thinking about it. And I'd love to ask Corey, who you're the one who saw this for the first time. You know, we saw it as kids. You're seeing it as an adult. You're seeing it in the year 2023. Are you like, this is gross? Or were you like, no, I get it. No, because I agree with you, Dylan. Like at the, at first she, cause she kind of seems like she um, does want to find a genuine connection with somebody. And she's like trying to find it here and there and everywhere. But then like, she sees this guy it's it is he's got this refreshing outlook on life and then they seem to have this relationship that's growing and then out of nowhere he's like i can't do this because i'm a kid and she is at first like are you just trying to get out of this whatever but then i see the change when she finds him when he leaves uh out of the meeting and then she comes to find him at the machine making a wish and like, I see her start treating him differently up until the moment where she actually sees him turn back into a kid. Um, so I did notice that. Like, but at first she she just thought she was with a, an adult, like a a consenting adult. Yeah. Um, you know, and he kind of started getting into that role at himself, like not wanting to talk to his friend on the phone. I got deadlines. I got to could you, you know, um, like he had the secretary taking care of whoever was like he was like really starting to get into his role yeah um, you see him start drinking coffee and stopping into like all the kids things yeah so like yeah he felt he seemed like an adult well i think that's that's a major portion of like it you you summed it up very well in your brief synopsis of him like realizing the grass isn't always greener or being an adult and for a while he's really succeeding as an adult and you have that moment where he finally realizes like i'm not ready for all the pressure that comes with this which as an adult who can't go back i still feel that way all the time <laughs> you know what i mean um yeah so poor josh is like i just want to be 13 again yeah yeah um why don't you talk about what you'd like to talk about? real quick before that i did totally write down exactly what gab is saying here though uh, let me see if i can search for it I wrote, is Susan a diddler or does Zoltar make her not a diddler? <laughs> that was like my my summed up version of that. I I don't think she would have been interested in him. No, she would not have been interested in him if he wasn't. Yeah. Also, I wrote, because there's the moment, it's after the first time that, um, you know, they it clearly alludes to them having sex. And then the next day we see Josh come into the office and he's talking to his secretary different. And I wrote, has sex rapidly aged Josh that he now drinks coffee and isn't as toy conscious? Like, I was like, was that like the moment that he was like, nothing else matters anymore. <laughs> I'm over toys. Honestly, when he when he goes back to being a child, is he still a virgin? Does he get his virginity back? His his, his child body didn't do it. So I uh, I think he's still a virgin. Uh, to quote James Franco in Pineapple Express, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. <laughs> Look, it comes out of the bag. You know what I mean? I think it's already, I think it's already done. Oh wait, it was still his body. He just got small again. Well, it's like you were still. It was still your body when you were thirteen. Oh yeah, so he's not a virgin now. Yeah, it's like, it's like time travel. No, let's not get into a time travel discussion. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna lose it. But does that make Susan a diddler? Yes. No, because she he he was an adult when she did it. You know? Well, it's the way Josh aged from 13 to 30 back to 13. Really. So she was right in that window of not diddler. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good for her. Um, Good job, Susan. Uh, there was a couple of things in the movie that I was like, this is, this is not believable for me. Uh, well, I, 
okay, how serious are these things in a movie where a little boy turns into an adult? Are you like, this was not believable? Okay, so like let's the, hear that. I, if if a dog walked onto the screen and started talking, I'd be cool with that. <laughs> but like, <laughs> wait, proceed. <laughs> I'm cool. I'm cool with talking animals. We did watch Little Nikki last night. But I'm not cool with the police not being involved at all with this. This mom is sitting there in her house waiting for some man to call her and be like, "Yeah, your son's all right," and he said this, and the cops aren't involved. But also. I would say presumably the, the police are involved. They, we just don't see that because the movie's not about the missing child. It's about Josh on his journey. It's not about the mom looking for a child. It's not like a fugitive scenario where it's like, where is my son? I need to find this man. I don't know. I think the police should have been involved. She seemed like an absentee mother. Yeah, I think the police should have been more involved. That was it for me. Like To me, that was like the biggest... Yeah, and the father the father being there for that one scene, and then he's never, like, around ever again. Now, again, I think it's just, like, I, I again, assume the first morning that the father just isn't there, he's working or whatever. It is weird, though, that they never show him again. Would it be easier? Would you feel like the problem doesn't exist if they just don't show the father at the fair in the beginning? Um. Yeah, I feel like the father should have never been there if he wasn't going to ever be there again. Like this is yeah, it's one of those things in the writing and editing that I think maybe there was more of a role there that they just were like, we don't need this. We're trying to cut this movie down, make it tighter, and it just got eliminated at some point. Yeah, but there's nothing else really that there's nothing else. Really, I mean, I overall, I mean, can I say that I enjoyed the movie? I mean, like I did. I, I first of all, how can you not enjoy Tom Hanks? Like, it's great. He does a really but, good job making you believe that he is. 13 like in the beginning i'm sorry i just want to cut in and say one thing um tom hanks i believe and i'm sure dylan you have facts about this spent time with that boy that played young josh so he could better adapt his mannerisms to look like him being an adult i may have some facts about that cab you know what's something that i i heavily mix up in this movie also his his friend who i think is a little kid who gives a great performance um is played by an actor named Jared Rushton, who I thought was the same kid from Terminator 2, who's the friend in that. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? The kid in Terminator 2 who, like, lies to the T-1000 for him and shit, and who also played the voice of Stoop Kid from Hey Arnold. Stoop Kid? Stoop Kid's afraid to leave a stoop. Yeah. They look very similar. Fuck, it doesn't help if you guys don't know who I'm talking about. No. <laughs> but I know Stoop Kid. Did you catch Corey's reference? In, it's a Hey Arnold on the beginning of this episode. No. Yeah, the Rex Smythe Higgins. Oh, well, yeah, that. We're talking about the fair. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else were we talking about with this movie? Oh, one thing that I find like again, it wouldn't make sense to show this in the movie, but I'm like, for the rest of his, his life, it would make sense. Why did Why do uh, Billy or Josh not use this wonderful wish machine again? Now that they know it works, just to grant wishes if you can get quarters in the mouth. Yeah, like Honestly. you can have it. These aren't monkey's paw wishes either. Like the the Zoltar did not curse him into like you're an adult, but you're in crippling debt and you're in a coma as an adult forever. Like no, the Zoltar was just like you're an adult. Yeah, do with it what you will, and and no repercussions. That it was very easy to get out of. Yeah, yeah, I would be like, give me a bunch of fucking quarters. We're about to rule the world. Yep, same. But you and I both have addictive addictive personalities. So <laughs> I just need to get one more quarter in this thing's fucking mouth. <laughs> So what so what do you think happens? He goes he becomes a kid and then that job now is just available. So the father from home alone can have that job now? I I think they're already on the same um I think they're already both vice presidents. So I think it's just uh, a, maybe John Lovett gets that job. Probably not. He seems like a lazy employee, but somebody's got to fill that position. You think he John Lovett's now dates the girlfriend? No. Susan? No. John Lovitz, who, by the way, is in Little Nicky. <laughs> also in Little Nicky, yes. Um, Here's a real question. Do you think, like, is Robert Loja like, what's happened to Josh? We gotta find him. <laughs> like, is he- Well, he loves Josh? him. Yeah. yeah. He was more of a father than the father. Well, I think also the movie becomes very different. If you get rid of that father in that beginning scene, and Josh doesn't have a father, 
you can make it very different when Josh develops this relationship with Robert Loge's character. And Robert Loge's character could be like, you know, youth is wasted on the young. If I could be a kid again, like they, there could be this whole thing about the importance of youth that comes from him and a paternal role. And that sort of just doesn't happen. Not that it ruins the movie, but yeah, that would make more sense. It could have been deeper. And then Robert Loja finds out that he was a kid, meets the mom, and becomes his stepdad. No, that'd be weird. Also, because Robert Loja maybe just looks older, but I feel like he's too old to be his actual dad once he's 13. He could be his dad once he's 30. No, but then there's a TV show. Oh, my you, watch, you watch 90 Day Fiance. Crazier things happen. Of course, crazier things happen. Um, you know what? It could work. You know what I think is really funny, too? What? To go back to his little friend. Um, I think it's hilarious that he gives him the printout of the Zoltar machine locations. And he's like, slaps it on his desk. And he's like, we found it. And I'm expecting like a list of like a government printout of where Zoltar locations are. And instead, it's just like he wrote like this part in fucking like crayon, it looks like. And you're like, oh, OK. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think there were definitely times when I thought to myself, these kids are acting either a lot younger or a lot older than 13. I did just find something in my notes that made me go back to the Diddler argument. Oh, let's hear it. Susan has a line. And again, there's there's two very sweet lines towards the end. And one of them leans a little Diddler, one of them does. Okay. Josh says to her, I've been thinking about it. There's a million reasons for me to go home, but there's only one reason to stay, which I think is a wonderful, very sweet line. That line I love. Later, Susan, once she's realized he's a kid, she's like, I'll drive you home. And she says, 10 years, who knows? Maybe you should hold on to my number. And I'm like, mm, is that okay? Was that, should you not say that? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's fine. She wants to wait till it's legal. Yeah. She's like one of those people who, people used to like, Kept down to when the Olsons are legal. Like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, kept yeah. down to when Josh is legal to fuck again. I mean, they yeah. would they call that grooming if she kind of like hung around? Well, she must be. You know, I've already really groomed him then. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. And also just like to, to, to put it in perspective also, 10 years makes him 23. So she's not even saying, you know, five years when you're 18. She's like, call me when you've, you know, got a master's degree. When you got out of college and you, uh, you know, test driven a few cars already. I mean, presumably she's not that much older than that. Presumably she's supposed to be like around the same age he is once he's big. She's supposed to be like 30. Yeah, that is true. Um, another side note. Do you remember when we watched um, that Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger movie? True Lies. Thank you. True Lies. Thank you. And Jamie Lee Curtis. Arnold Schwarzenegger was blindfolded and Jamie Lee Curtis was like kissing him or maybe it was vice versa. And I said to you, Corey, if you were blindfolded and I kissed you, would you know it was me? And he said, yeah, like I would smell you. I would recognize the feel like it would just be very obvious if it were the person that you kiss all the time versus a stranger. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's the same that like if you were accidentally having sex with a 13 year old that you'd be like, something is weird here. This person doesn't seem to know at all what they're doing. Like, don't you think it would it would set off some red flags? Not necessarily in like a, I need to call the police to explain what I've done so I don't go to jail. Like not in a diddler way, just in like a like, for example, we know some people, Corey and I know some people who are definitely headed toward 40, 40 year old virginhood. 40 year old virgin. 40 year old virgin. That's that's and, what I would think Susan thinks. I would think Susan must think like this guy must still be a virgin because he probably had like that same innocence during sex where he, was, he probably was just like, I don't know what to do here. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. But that's not like that's not enough to be like, OK, this relationship is over. That was really uncomfortable. Or he could have been really rough because him and his buddy will get dirty magazines sometimes. And. I feel like that type of that type of thing gets men to think that they could just treat women however they want. I guess, Corey, I don't like you taking this some SBU direction. <laughs> no, 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 no. Did you I see, saw it in the magazine. Did like you see when he was like, you want to go get some dirty magazines or something? And he's like, nah, man, I got to work tomorrow. Dirty magazines for them could have been Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, too, though. Bro. Yeah, they're not going to sell them. Like when you're 13, you're like, at, at the age of 13, you're like passing by bras and stores you're like no but go they had the newsstands with the with like they were half covered and you knew what it was yeah, oh okay it 
to you on rage. Yeah, but they would sell it to that 30-year-old Forrest Gump-looking motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so Corey thinks that, like, the missing subplot is that, like, so Tom Hanks is probably looking at board every time we don't see him on screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one, he was gearing up for that moment. Maybe. I just still think even no matter how much porn you watch, because some of these people we know are probably watching porn a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, hold on a second. But we'll come back to that in a second. But Tom Hanks was staying in that really shitty hotel and there were gunshots going on outside and he was awfully calm about it. And he's from the suburbs. He's not calm about it. He's terrified. He's terrified. He cries. He's in the fetal position crying the first time. He gets used to it. He adjusts to oh, it. Yeah. But yeah, they show him terrified. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, What was I going to say? You know what's interesting? People never questioned him hanging around with the 13-year-old as a 30-year-old. I guess yeah. we do see one person thinks it's his son, yeah. but like they, they both laugh at it. I don't know. Yeah, I thought that the, you would assume it was like a big daddy situation. I did also love his friend has some really good lines. His friend says to him, I'm three months older than you are, asshole. At one point, I'm like, that's a hilarious line. And he says, yeah, that's great. When he finds out that he's been vice, vice president, he goes, that means if the president dies, you get to take over. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah, he's obviously the adult in their relationship. Yeah, I would say so. Like, they clearly make a point of showing, and I guess it's important with how the movie goes, that Josh is very, very naive still. Yeah. Who's the most naive person you know, Dylan? Are you saying that I'm the most naive person you know, or are you asking? No, I'm asking you. Like? You don't have to use names, but like, do you have anybody in mind that you know is very naive? No, I'm like, is it me? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think I know anybody who I think of that I'm like, what a naive moron, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's one person in particular that I'm thinking of who I've already referenced that Corey and I know who like still lives at home, doesn't really have any like responsibility or bills, will often say like just like discuss in a group about how they like don't have a, a significant other and like their relationship status is so bad and but like can't communicate with the opposite sex at all and like definitely as a virgin like just like it's rough and it's not getting any less rough as the years go on okay i get who you're referencing then as the fact that they're like gonna be the 40 year old virgin you were saying okay yeah 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 oh you know what i really like also the zoltar music I feel like they do just a really good job of making Zoltar like semi horrific in this like child comedy. Sure. Like it has this yeah. creepy music. They show that it's not plugged in, which again only makes Zoltar even better. It works when it's not plugged in and it grants real wishes. Yeah. Yeah. It could have been an episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark? This would totally work if you make, you could like, you could definitely make this into a short movie, like a 20 minute movie where a lot of this is the same. Just yeah. without yeah, it could keep true. happening like a Black Mirror type situation. Yeah, but then he's just going to nail being an adult at some point. Although he sort of stumbles into nailing adulthood anyway. And then he just but realizes be, this kind of sucks. Yeah, but it could be anything. You could be like a poor person who turns rich. You could be like... Oh, well, I feel like Black Mirror sort of does those episodes already, yeah. Yeah, you could do like an adult who turns back into a kid. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, you know when you're like, if I was back in high school with the brain I have now, you know what I mean? Like shit like that. All right, Corey, would you rather be an adult or a kid and why? And by kid, let's say let's say 16. I think 16 is like a decent in between. Would you rather be 34 or 16? Show your work. I'd rather be an adult. I'd rather be 34 because when you're 16, after a while, people just stop fucking listening to you. And well, wait, there's nobody... a crucial question we need to ask Gap in this scenario. Are you just like tomorrow, you still live with Gab, you're just 16 now, or do you go back in time to when you were 16? Back in time. Back in time. Corey, you got to go back. Invest in Google, bro. Like, it's over. 34 <laughs> year old then will thank you. That's true. That's true. But if I had to deal with the, the things I had to deal with at that age, I, I would rather not. Oh, yeah. Nobody wants to go back to being 16. Like, you know, being 16 is an awful age to be. But Honestly, if I can go back a lot of the knowledge I have, I can yeah. manipulate stocks. Like, Wait. I can write shittier versions of very famous movies. But I, I was going to say, I really wouldn't even want to be in my 20s, to be honest. Same. 
Yeah, I'm like, boy, this is the best it's been so far. Damn it. <laughs> it's so true. I wouldn't want to be 16 again. You know, we were looking at pictures of us today from like last year, just in terms of like our fitness level, um, like watching vi old videos of us trying to climb a rope when we didn't know how to climb it, whatever. And um, I stumbled across my prom picture and I was so skinny. And I remember thinking like I was so fat. You know what I mean? I just wouldn't want to go back to that time when you just feel so insecure all the time. And you're always afraid that people are laughing at you or you're like, you're weird and everyone feels uncomfortable. And like, I just would never want to go back to that. But I also wouldn't want to be in my 20s where you feel that way, except you have a job and bills. <laughs> For me, I feel like at around the 16, I feel like I went from like, I was such a happy kid. And then when I got into like my teenage years, I kind of for a while just developed this chip on my shoulder that I just like, I don't even know where it came from. And it was just such a, like an, a, like a long stretch of time where I just had this chip on my shoulder for no fucking reason. Like I just felt like people owed me shit, you know what I mean? And and like, I don't feel like that at all, <laughs> you know? Well, it's I feel like we all go through stages like that where it's like you feel so dead set on something that is sort of ridiculous. Like when I'm 16, I know that there was a part of me that was like, everything now is stupid. Like, oh, you're into Fall Boy? Fall Boy sucks ass. And now I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go to see Fall Boy in like a couple months. And I'm like, yeah, no, they're fine. I get it. I was, well, I was. Yeah. You, you're, you're just like, you develop these attitudes either to think of, to perceive yourself in a way that you find favorable. Then you realize later that you're like, why was I doing that? Like I used to feel, I feel like I was very, non-contrarian and i was like people think this is cool i think it's lame like oh yeah i'm different i think that's stupid that thing you love. yeah we were literally just talking about that today that like there were so many people who were like you like in sync like oh that's terrible i like this band you've never heard of and like you get to an age where you're like undeniably like in sync had good music you don't have to love pop music you don't have to like in sync but like you ha you are able to recognize objectively that like it was a hit you know what i mean like but it was like it's really po sorry i don't no, mean go to ahead. cut you off. it was also super popular to be like an everything sucks kind of person where it's like i only listen to this music and while you all listen to that like you like green day there's actual real punk bands that i like and uh there's just a whole group of people that you're now a part of you're just not part of this group you're still like you're not like yeah you're not yeah. Well, that's the thing. You don't realize it and you just think like, if I'm being against what the group thinks is cool, that makes me a cool individual. And it's like, no, it just makes you kind of a dick at the time. You know, if you're just being like against people for no reason. Yeah. And we talk about that all the time here in New York City, too, where there are so many people that walk around like different. You know what I mean? They're wearing like different clothes and their hair is different and they have tattoos and piercings. And like you can tell that they're from a small town where they are different. You know what I mean? Like they're like the goth kid from their high school. But then they come here and it's like, no, you're one of a million. Everyone here thinks they're different. Like sit down. Yeah. And like, you know, I, I sorry again. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I think it's fine to be different. It's just not fine to be different and think everyone else is less than you. Like be different and find people right. who are also there is there's gonna be people different in a similar way to how you're different. And you know what? Find those people. But don't that's be cool. like people who aren't different, you suck. Yeah, yeah. And that's where it's that's where it because it's like there's things I don't care about, right? Like and and I don't hate them. I don't feel that strongly about them. I just don't really think about them. You know what I mean? Like I don't necess I don't think about the Jonas brothers, right? Like I don't really care. But if a I'm a sucker for you. Like, if that comes out, I'm like, oh, this is kind of a little bop. You know what I mean? But I'm not like, I don't seek it out, but I don't shit on Jonas Brothers fans because they love it. Like, whatever you love, just love it. I got tattoos all over my arms. I don't think I'm the most unique person in the world. I actually think I'm more part of a bigger group of people that think it's cool to get tattoos. I, mean, I think I used to be the exact same way to what you're describing. And now I do the same thing where it's like, I, oh my God, what's the, what's the boy band that Harry Styles was part of? One Direction. There's one One Direction song that I was like, this song fucking slaps. And I don't remember what song it was, but I was like, no, this is really cool. I don't give a shit that it's One Direction. Like, I'm old enough that I don't Hold care on. anymore. Absolutely. I have two things. Number one, you didn't know Harry Styles was in One Direction? No, I thought Harry Styles was just Harry Styles. No, he's from One Direction. He is just one. He is just Harry Styles now. But he, yeah, 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 yeah. He was the Justin Timberlake of 
One Direction, where he rose above the boy band. Yes. Now, side note. Or the Beyonce of Destiny's Child. Sure. Yes. Very similar. Yes. Or the Michael Jackson. All right. Okay. Okay. okay we get it. Um, I One Direction was like, we were a little bit too old for One Direction. Yeah, that was. Crazy. And a lot of my friends were like, oh, you got to listen to them. You would love them. Like, you love it in sync. You love boy bands. Like, you should. And I was like, no, no, no. We're too old for that. They're too young for me. Blah, blah, whatever. Finally, one day I caved. I was taking the LIRR from Ronkonko to Penn Station, and I had all this time. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to listen to One Direction. So I bought the album on iTunes. I listened to it, and I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. And I got really into One Direction, and literally the next day they broke up. <laughs> so that was your fault. It's like the time that I, Joan Rivers died after I met her. Yeah. You killed Joe sure. Rivers? <laughs> That's what my best friend said. Sweetheart, too. She was a really sweet lady. Yeah, she's dead. I had to look it up to remember the song. The song was Drag Me Down by uh, One Direction. Okay. Nobody can drag me down. Nobody, nobody. 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 Yeah. I'm I love to... Stockholm Syndrome. That's my favorite. Wow. Oh, that's a song. Yeah. There's an irony to like <laughs> Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I actually, it's funny that we're on the subject because. Um, and we're and it's perfect because we're talking about big and like age and all this shit. So I have a client. I think he's 21, 22 years old. And at my age now, I feel like sometimes we for, like it's you don't think you can connect with someone that's in a different generation that they like different things. And, you know, what's popular now is like me seem like it would be silly when you were that age. And we were talking about music the other day. And he was asking me what kind of music I like. And he, first of all, the first question was, do you listen to music? Whoa. And I said, do people not listen to music? And he's like, well, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. You do meet people once in a while who are just like, I'm not really into music. And I'm like, yeah, what? I've heard that before. Well, that's like, people are like, don't really watch movies. Don't have a television. Like, Giselle's uncle doesn't have a television. I'm like, what do you do all day? How do you live? Do, do you just converse? Fair in fairness, it's hard for me to get through a movie sometimes. I'm a, I'm a big fall asleep person, but like I do love movies. But uh, yeah, I'm talking to this kid, and I'm like, you end, actually end up like really learning a lot from somebody. I was listening to this Fifty Cent interview, and he was talking about like because a lot of people talk about how the new rap sucks and all this shit, and he's like, but it's weird if you're like in your forties and fifties and you're still trying to rap. Like he's like, it's a you, it's a young person's genre so these new people it's just rap is so young that it's evolving constantly so if you find some shit that you like you can just figure out if you appreciate it or the old shit still exists you can just continue to keep listening to it i feel like that's always though whatever music genre is popular it sort of becomes a young man's game and then you sort of watch musicians grow older like i love the rolling stones but i don't i can't imagine that there's anybody who like gets into the Rolling Stones with their album that comes out this year and is like, oh, I'm a Rolling Stones fan because of their 2023 album when they were all in their 80s. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? When they yeah. put out their music, they were that generation and they were part of the voice of that generation. And that's what makes them resonate to an extent. Same thing with a lot of rappers. Like Eminem was a cultural touchstone. Same thing with like, you think of guys like Tupac and, you know, Biggie and like, yeah, they were a huge deal. And... You can't imagine, like, Eminem still raps sometimes, and it's like, it's weird thinking of 40 and 50-year-old Eminem rapping. I actually, I actually appreciate, I'm, I'm like the biggest Eminem fan in the world. I actually really appreciate that I got to kind of be watching MTV and be like nine years old and hear him be like, hi, my name, and go from being, like, go to being a little heavier in the voice and just doing exactly what you feel like he wanted to do the whole time, which is really just be as lyrical as possible. And he doesn't really, I mean, he's one of the top selling artists of all time. Like, so now it's kind of interesting to see. I feel like that about Jay-Z too. But um, yeah, it's just kind of cool to see. But like, but maybe like if you think of a band like Green Day or something, when you're like, if they put out an album now, would they? Like, I think their old punky shit is really dope, but I think American Idiot is a classic. Well, yeah, and I feel like right after that, like, I, does anybody remember what their next album was? I remember they put out three albums in like three months, and it was called Uno Dos Trace, and no one cared. It was just like, no, we're sort of just past that. now. And I'm sure yeah, there are massive Green yeah. Day fans out there who like loved those albums. But, you know, it's like culturally, we all find our way into some sort of thing at the same time. For sure. 
and 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 that sorry but that is where you find the people that as we're all finding our way into something that are like oh everybody's finding their way into this fuck this that sucks so it's yep. like does it because it can't really suck if every body likes it four million chinese people can't be wrong michael <laughs> that's a lost boys reference yes i was like well, oh my god we did that on the podcast yeah. which one was it okay um i just want to say while we're on the subject that uh the Sync reunion tour is uh something that i am manifesting they were at the vmas together they presented an award to taylor swift um they're putting out a new song for trolls three I have been waiting for this for 20 years and I'm really excited. Um, so I just want to make that very crystal clear to everybody. Uh, please pray for me at night before you go to sleep. But also, um, yeah, how about this movie? Yeah. Oh, were we talking about Big? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were talking about Big. Oh, 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 hold on. I have two things. Number one, do you remember when we were kids and you thought the lyrics to um, It's Gonna Be Me were... Shoot me, hate me, but it ain't no lie. Do you remember that? Because you did. No, but you know what? That makes sense to me. What's the actual lyrics? You may hate me, but it ain't no lie. Personally, you thought I it connect was more with shoot me and hate me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it ain't no lie. And then we also argued about the lyrics to Sexy Back when that song came out. Um, But I remember what it was that either one of us thought. I don't remember either. Yeah, but anyway. I also remember you guys ripping on me hardcore because we were... Lowrider came on and I did air guitar to the trumpet of Lowrider. And you guys were like, you fucking idiot. It's a trumpet. Literally. Oh, you went. <laughs> I went. <laughs> I, was, uh -huh. I was doing the hands of a guitar while going. <laughs> yeah, they, they came down on me hard on that. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. <laughs> that I remember. Yikes. It seems like we're out of strong opinions here. Should we get to some facts? Please. I want the truth. Face the facts, dokes. Facts have no place with an organized religion. Start with our ratings. IMDb gives Big a 7.3 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes on the tomato meter, it has a 98%. With an average rating of 7.9 out of 10, 78 fresh reviews, and 2 rotten. Audience score gives an 82% with an average score of 3.9 out of 5. Uh, it had a budget of $18 million, and it grossed $152 million. Whoa, okay, Scotty Cameron, how about that one? It was directed by Penny Marshall, who also directed A League of Their Own, Renaissance Man, and Jumpin' Jack Flash. Because Love Jumpin' Jack Flash. I've never seen the movie. I just always know the name of it because of the Rolling Stones song. The Rolling Stones. Yeah, it's a great movie. Whoopi Goldberg. Look it up. I'll, movie, I'll add it to my list. The movie was written by Gary Ross and Anne Spielberg, who is the sister of Steven, who also wrote Seabiscuit, The Hunger Games, and Ocean's 8. Starring Sandra Bullock. Starring Sandra Bullock. The movie stars Tom Hanks as Josh, who you may know from Castaway, Saving Private Ryan, and Toy Story, if you're Corey exclusively from Toy Story. Uh, Elizabeth Perkins as Susan, who you may know from The Flintstones, 28 Days, and Cats and Dogs. Was she Betty in The Flintstones? She was uh, Velma. Wilma. Wilma. Velma is from Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo, yeah. Scooby -Doo. yeah. yeah. Um, close enough. Thank you for correcting me. And Robert Loggia as McMillan, who you may know from Independence Day, Scarface, and Over the Top. Frank Lopez is who he was in Scarface. Sorry, I'm just chiming in. This town is one big chicken waiting to get plucked. <laughs> TBS version. The music was... <laughs> I'm so glad you got that reference. How'd you get that score on your face? Eating pineapple? I'm going to start like this, eating pineapple? <laughs> uh, the music for Big was composed by Howard Shore, who also did the music for the Lord of the Rings movies, Scanners, The Fly... Videodrome, Silence of the Lambs, Philadelphia, and Spotlight. Um, it was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay and Best Lead Actor. This was Hank's first Oscar nomination, and he won the Golden Globe. Some critics, critics consensus, refreshingly sweet and undeniably funny. Undeniably funny. Don't you deny it. Big is a showcase for Tom Hanks, who dives into this role and infuses it with charm and surprising poignancy. Jonathan Rosenbaum from the Chicago Reader said, As far as the movie's message is considered, if only grown-ups could be more like kids, Jerry Lewis did an infinitely better job of plugging it in the 50s. I think he was one of the two bad movies that I found. Yeah. Keith Phipps from The Dissolve, a funny, bittersweet film that opens as a cautionary tale about growing up too fast, but deepens into a movie about the unplumbable gulf between childhood and adulthood. 
And hmm? were you going to say something? No, I said cute. Oh, okay. Finally, Arthur Ryle Lindsay from Slant Magazine, the consummate 80s film about kiddom and growing too fast. All right, let's get to some funner facts. Please. According to Robert Loggia, on the day they filmed the famous walking piano scene at FAO Schwartz, he and Tom Hanks noticed that the doubles dressed like them were on hand just in case they could not do the dance correctly. It became their goal to do the entire number without the aid of the doubles, and they succeeded. Wow, that's great. Gab, as you alluded to before, to give Tom Hanks an idea of how a 13-year-old would behave, director Penny Marshall filmed each grown-up scene with David Moscow, the actor who plays young Josh, playing Hanks' part, and then Hanks would copy Moscow's behavior. Hanks would go on to do something similar for Forrest Gump, where he would spend time with Michael Connor Humphreys, who played young Forrest, and imitate his southern accent to prepare for the part. Oh, I think that is actually the fact that I was thinking of. Yeah, but he sort of did, it's saying that he did something very similar in this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Tom Hanks is so good. Tom Hanks is too pure for this one. Yeah. Penny Marshall became the first female director to ever direct a movie that grossed more than $100 million at the box office with this movie. Let's go, ladies. Tom Hanks improvised the scene where he eats the baby corn as if it were normal-sized corn on the cob. <laughs> That's so funny. Which I think, besides the walking piano, is the most memorable like clip from this movie that I feel like I see. Is Tom Hanks... Yeah. We used to do that at the Chinese restaurant. Did you really? Me well, I feel like... And Zach? Yeah. Yeah, it's because we saw this movie. That's what Right. Saying. Yeah, of course. That's what I mean. The amusement park where Josh finds the Zoltar machine is Playland, which has been operating in Rye, New York since 1928. Oh, right. Been there. Used to go there all the time. Yeah, of course. And at the time the movie was made, Tom Hanks was 31 and Elizabeth Perkins was 28. Let's see. I got three more, four more. Co-writer Ann Spielberg had What I Grew Up as the title of this movie in mind, but her co-writer Gary Ross persuaded her that it should be big. He came up with the title because as a kid, he used to say big to his father when he wanted him to place him on his shoulders. <laughs> big. The costume designers took special care to ensure that Susan realistically transitions from uptight businesswoman at the beginning of the movie to sweet, more girl-like persona that she is at the end. We notice her wardrobe and hair gradually become less and less adult. Her hair goes from pinned up to loose and, uh, let's see here. Then with schoolgirl handbands, her clothes from tight suits to loose girlish angora, se angora separates? I do not know fashion well enough to be saying these things. Me neither. And, uh, young skirts and her shoes from heels to flats and more that of a student. She may turn down the offer to become a little girl again, but we are left with the clear impression that thanks to her relationship with Josh, she has found her inner child. So here was the thing I was talking about before with Elizabeth Perkins. At the end of the movie, when Susan discovers Josh's real age, she was scripted to kiss him goodbye on the lips. However, Elizabeth Perkins insisted that she do so on the forehead instead. Thank God. I think that, I think that choice makes a huge difference in how we see Susan at the end of the movie, that she, like, understands he's a kid and treats him as so. Agreed. That's a yike. And last thing, uh, Giselle actually brought this up to me and I was like, no way, and I googled it. Tom Hanks and Paul Abdul cross paths in big. Paul Abdul was the one responsible for choreographing the legendary giant keyboard dance with Hanks and Robert Loggia. Even if you haven't seen the film, the scene made an indelible mark in pop culture. Hanks gave Paul Abdul immense credit and told her, my biggest claim to fame is that you once choreographed me. Wow, that's awesome choreographed though i mean i guess they move around a little bit but they're just playing chopsticks and uh heart and soul yeah but they do yeah but they're doing a dance yeah. yeah they're they're dancing the two now all right you too it was very impressive it was very like gene kelly and the other guy yes fred astaire no not fred astaire you seen singing in the rain when there's like nothing can be granted it's a beat in louisiana in the morning <laughs> <laughs> i did not expect you to pull that out um one of one of my faves. Why am I forgetting the other guy's name? Gene Kelly and uh, Richard Simmons. Yeah, I'm googling real quick. Robert Redford. Is that just a guess? Donald O'Connor. Yes, Donald O'Connor. In the in the in the there's a woman in that scene as well. She's doing it too, but it's great. Gene Kelly makes a waistcoat look better than anybody. I don't think anybody's fighting for that title, but sure. Yeah. That is all the facts that I have. I guess also I'll just throw out Paul Abdul, the first Laker girl. Oh, interesting. Paul Abdul, first person to do a duet with a cartoon cat. I don't think that's necessarily true. Yeah, have you seen Space Jam? <laughs> well, um, 
You don't have to acknowledge that. Mary Poppins. They're doing duets with cartoons. Yeah, but not... She's saying... I'm talking about like a, a song that was played on the radio. Yeah, that music video. Yeah. Oh, right. so it's a track a question. What? Um, so it's a track? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Corey, your question. Do you like... Do you, what, did you, what movie do you think is better? Who Framed Roger Rabbit or Cool World? What's Cool World? Yeah, what's Cool World? It was a movie with Brad Pitt and uh, Kim Basinger and half of, and half of the world was cartoons and half of it was people. You got to look it up. It's great. Also, I'd just like to point out, Corey has never seen Cool Runnings. We work out at a gym where one of the Olympic bobsledders works out. And every time I see him, I'm like, uh, you know, I, I, I can't think of it right now, but the cool running's like, feel the rhythm, feel the, feel the rhythm. rhythm. Yeah, and uh, Corey's never seen that movie, so. I had never seen it until like probably two to four years ago. What? But I've seen The Land Before Time. Okay, so late. All right, that's a random flex, but okay, good for you, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy for you. I would have to pick Who Framed Roger Rabbit based on me not having seen Cool World. It's a good one. Who Framed Roger Rabbit or Cool Runnings? Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Space Jam or Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I feel like Who Framed Roger Rabbit is the better movie, but Space Jam has the better nostalgia in my brain. So I get it. I feel like if I saw Space Jam now for the first time, I would treat it the same way as when I saw Space Jam 2, which I was like, this sucks ass. But because I saw it as a kid, it's just in my brain. Welcome to the Space Jam is one of the best beginnings of a movie songs since Grease is the word. I love Grease this. Lightning. That song. Frankie Valli. R.I.P. Grease concert I've been watching. He's alive. Don't you Sorry, I'm thinking, Sorry I'm thinking about Tony Bennett. I'm thinking about Tony Bennett. Sorry, Frankie Valli. Please, please live. <laughs> oh my God. That was the first right. concert I ever went to was Frankie Valli and the Force. Okay, well, the, the first concert I ever went to was Aaron Carter and the 18s, so. I still don't know who the fuck the 18s are. <laughs> Yes, Frankie you do. Valley outlived Aaron Carter. That is crazy. Maybe he killed Aaron Carter. Dylan, don't be making accusations you can't back up. The police are going to be at your door soon. Listen, we got to wrap this thing up. I'm tired. All right, all right, Gab, we'll wrap this thing up. But first, we got to get to some mail. Mail time! When you control the mail, you control information. Mom asked me to ask you if there's any mail for us here by mistake. What? Okay, so we got a bunch of mail on the cat in the hat. So, first, Scotty Cameron coming in to let us know. Um, I remember I kept talking about, who was it that was in Batman from Cat in the Hat? Because I, of course, make everything about Batman. Yes, you do. But he let us know Michael Ironside voices Sam Fisher in the Splinter Cell video games, and Michael Ironside is also the voice of Darkseid. Cool. We have a comment on the Cat in the Hat from Lenola Cola. Hearing oh. about Global Buffet's old name gave me whiplash on the places you used to go to that no longer exist. The one location for me was an old KFC, which is still standing today. It's fenced off, but it wasn't demolished or repurposed for another franchise. That is very interesting to me because there is, it makes me think of two things. One, on Sunrise Highway nearby us, there is a Checkers that went out of business. And mm -hmm. if you've ever seen Checkers, or I think they call them rallies in the South, they're like these tiny little buildings. They don't really have an inside where you can eat. So they're not really, you can't repurpose them. So it is just yeah. sat there for like a decade, just as this form of checkers that you can pass by. Yep. And the other thing it makes me think of is anytime a white castle closes down and becomes something else, they just keep the castle shape. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're, you can totally tell. Um, You know what it makes me think of, Dill? Remember around the corner from my parents' house, there was the mini golf course? Yeah. So that mini golf course has been closed for like 10 years, but now it's just like a dilapidated rundown former mini golf course. Like they it's it's been totally like wrecked by teenagers with graffiti and like shit is like smashed and broken up. But like it's just vacant, which makes me think of the golf course from The Legend of Billie Jean where they would meet up, which was the old dilapidated golf course. Yeah. All right. Cool. I'm so glad that we spent 15 minutes trying to figure out the end of that sentence god damn it Gav, well i'm gonna cut that out so you need to act like that didn't just happen <laughs> all right fine say something great about the mini golf course <laughs> great mini golf course reference still <laughs> <laughs> oh that's gonna look so weird when i just cut to that <laughs> you sure know your mini golf courses <laughs> 
I am going to cut out everything before that, but we just dealt with like 15 minutes of Wi-Fi interruptions. <laughs> Continuing what Linola Cola said. Not so fun fact, my remaining memory of that KFC location was when my family ordered drive through on their on our way to a funeral. <laughs> Due to the nausea for my tolerance to perfume, I ended up puking outside the funeral parlor. Ah, the memories. Aw, that's nice. Is that one of those things now where, like, can you not have KFC ever again? Or are you still able to eat KFC and you just remember that thing? Um, yeah, I was just talking about that recently where, like, you you eat something and then it makes you sick and then you can't have it anymore. Um, but I don't remember in what context, so I'm sorry that I just took up time saying that. I had a roommate in college who was doing a bunch of like vodka and Gatorade, like was his chaser, and he threw up Gatorade everywhere, which looks like a bloodbath. So that was terrifying. Oh yeah. Um, and he was like, "I can't have Gatorade ever again." Oh, that's a sad life. His his electrolytes never recovered. <laughs> um, another comment from Mark Aquino, which I I think we have a couple of comments on this about. We were like, was Doctor Seuss or Dr. Soyce, as I hear it is sometimes pronounced, was he a racist or not or propagandist or whatever? Nazi. Yes. By the way, side note, Corey was listening to the episode and he texted me and said it was me who told you about Dr. Soyce. And I said, oh, I hope I didn't disparage you. And he said, no, it's all right. (laughs) Corey, the fucking idiot. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, whoever said that was a real piece of shit. (laughs) (laughs) That makes it way funnier, actually, to me now. (laughs) Um, Okay, so Mark referenced uh, 4705. In the 40s, during World War II, Dr. Seuss had done political cartoons that denounced Hitler and the Nazis. So far, so good. He also was a writer on a series of animated shorts called Private Snafu, which were made for the U.S. Army as training videos. Fun fact, the Private Snafu cartoons were made by the likes of Chuck Jones and Fritz Feeling, the same artists who did the classic Looney Tunes cartoons in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Jones and Freeling would go on to work with Dr. Seuss on ad- adapting his books into TV specials like How the Grinch Stole Christmas, among others. It's also ironic because this Cat in the Hat movie came out around the same time as the movie Looney Tunes Back in Action, and it made more money than that one did, which is a shame because whereas that felt like it was made by people who love Looney Tunes, this movie was the opposite and felt like it hated its own source material. I couldn't tell if you were, <laughs> I couldn't tell if you were I, present I, or just not responsive. No, no, I almost cut out, but I saved it. So it keep, said keep it, doing whatever it you hated it. I am. I'm I'm on high alert. Hated its own source material. Yes, he said the Looney Tunes back in action people clearly had a reverence for Looney Tunes, whereas I guess he did not feel that way about the cat in the hat. That's fair. Now let me ask you a question about the cat in the hat though, Dylan. Do you find Go yourself ahead. quoting it? Because at least once a week I have looked at Sally and said, This is not children, these little angels. First of all, I already don't remember that reference. What? The only- Mrs. Kwan. The only thing I found myself thinking of is fired. Oh, yeah. We say that at home all the time now. But uh, uh, my God, Mrs. Kwan is woken up from her nap by the mother when the mother comes home. And she was like, how is everything, Mrs. Kwan? And Mrs. Kwan goes, or no, she goes, how are the children, Mrs. Kwan? And Mrs. Kwan goes, these are not children. They're little angels. Okay. That does make more sense now. But no, I did not immediately. I I have not actively referenced it, but I have occasionally Uh, thought of it. You will. You will. It's coming. Uh, on our little comments about what is it that made Jim Carrey seem more okay as the Grinch than Mike Myers did as the cat, uh, Jordy B commented and said, it's the makeup. Mm, Pretty flat yeah. out, just said that's all it is. So I mm-hmm. kind of I kind of think we both agreed with that to an extent. Yeah. We have a comment here from Scotty Cameron. Uh, Michael Myers was in Brian Singer, which Brian Singer, we mentioned uh, his last movie, which was Bohemian Rhapsody where Myers plays a record label who uh, the head of a record label who rejects queen. Uh, Brian Singer was fired from Bohemian Rhapsody for frequent absences due to illness and legal problems involving his (laughs) involving his diddling. (laughs) I should laugh at that. It's just the fact that Scotty used diddling in his, in his comment. That makes me laugh. I love it. So wait, hold on. So Michael, Mike Myers was in Bohemian Rhapsody. Yes. uh, I think it was a very small role where he's the head of the record label. Like you said, who like, turns queen down before they become queen. is he, is he fat i don't know gav <laughs> i've got to look this up but what does brian singer have any also do you remember when we were younger those um on elvis duran those commercials where he'd be like oh that's steven singer i hate steven singer which i don't understand why we hate him but no i don't remember that uh, you know what i was i think he was elvis a duran? jeweler uh the, the war of the roses those like things oh, where that they were, like, wasn't 
that wasn't Elvis Duran. That was Car- Kid and Carolina. No, I'm pretty sure it was. Oh. I don't think so, but I do remember that, and I loved it. I love anything dramatic. Speaking of, have you been watching the new Love is Blind? No, don't watch Love is Blind. Oh, it's a mistake. You should be watching it. It's great. You should check out. They just canceled it, but Winning Time, the rise of the the Showtime Lakers, it's only 19 episodes, and it's great. Even if you're not into basketball, I think it's very good, because I'm not into basketball. Um, (laughs) Okay, so the the last thing that Scotty had said in this comment was, absent. Singer was fired for absences due to illness and legal problems involving his diddling, and Dexter Fletcher was hired to finish Bohemian Rhapsody as his replacement. Interesting. And he was the director? Yeah. It's rare that the director gets fired, but I feel like when it happens, it's a big deal. Yeah. Oh, with Bohemian Rhapsody, it turned out okay. Can you see? Yeah, he's uh, he's under a lot of makeup, uh, big wig, fake beard, big glasses. It reminds yeah. me of him being in Glorious Bastards, where it's like, oh, you barely recognized him in it. Yes, correct. And then we have one uh, long comment on Starship Troopers from Lieutenant Irish Keg. Hmm. Your guys' discussion has a lot of the common misconceptions about the film. You didn't discuss all of them, but I figure I'll list them uh, here for your thoughts. One, saying that the bugs have interstellar travel. It's mentioned in the film that Rico's desired off-world vacation spot is Zagama Beach, and then later in the film when he meets his new unit, it's declared it's gone, the bugs wiped it out. You have to remember this film is a propaganda film uh, from that movie Society. They didn't know the bugs could do that. Carmen is almost killed when the rogue asteroid comes out of nowhere with high gravity. That's because the bugs can perform interstellar travel and did launch interstellar attacks several times in the film. Humans just didn't know that and thought they launched low-speed, non-interstellar spores in asteroids. Later on, they knew that to be false and defended against another attack with new weapons on the moon. Which feels like it would have been a way cooler sequel than any of the actual directed video ones would have been like troopers on the moon defending the planet. <laughs> uh, two, the human government is not fascist. It's a limited enfranchisement, volunteer, liberal, democratic government. That's going to require more explanation, but I see that there is some. Sure. This has shown that you can quit at any time without consequence, except you will never be a citizen. Can you, though? I feel like in terms of what the movie says, like maybe this seems right according to the book, but maybe in the movie it feels like you would have gotten a whipping like Rico got if yeah. you just quit. Um, Let's see, where was I? This has shown that you can quit at any time without consequence, except you'll never be a citizen. Also, Rico's parents are super wealthy without being citizens. Well, that I do feel like we noticed. They even say he's going to Harvard with those shit test scores, meaning money still behaves the same way. Hey, you don't know that. Maybe he was great on the rowing team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent rower. Uh, they even say he's going to Harvard. Also, the Supreme Military Authority steps down after the disaster and is replaced by a black woman who has better strategy. Well, I think something you notice with Verhoeven is it's still expected to be a society where people are equal. That's why he always has this thing with like locker rooms where the men and women are together. and Nobody cares because he's like, because society yeah. doesn't care by that point. But you can still be fascist without necessarily being racist absolutely the two are not mutually exclusive they're just common bosom buddies uh citizens have more rights than civilians but all the civilians can still enjoy most rights except voting or being given preferential allotment for children which is why the one girl signed up for quote many babies instead of one oh that's kind of a big deal (laughs) if it's like well you can't vote and you can't have children yeah also, the film shows a future that's gotten past racism, sexism, and nationalism. Rico is somehow from Buenos Aires, but all his squad mates are from all walks of life. Not equality of fascism again. Finally, once a citizen, you can vote, and voting acts like normal liberal democracy. Three, there was no false flag attack. The humans technically started the war by invading Iraq and the ground. The Federations told the Mormons. I'm guessing that's a typo, because I don't remember Mormons. <laughs> yeah. The Federations told the Mormons not to go and settle because they knew that was arachnid territory. But since it's not a dictatorship, they let them go and the bugs slaughtered the invaders. Maybe that's in the book. They mentioned that Mormons are maybe maybe that's a very quick thing in the movie that I forgot about. Yeah. Like, remember when they went and saw the all the remains of like the people? I think maybe they maybe they were Mormons. I don't remember if Mormons specifically being mentioned. Yeah. Okay. But since it's not a dictatorship, they let them go and the bugs slaughter the invaders. 
they, the bugs, don't have a concept of government since it's a hive mind. Well, they do have a hierarchy, as we've seen, you know, with the brain mm -hmm. bug on top. Uh, so they consider that the start of the war. Just like the news reporter said on the station, some say the bugs were provoked by the intrusion of humans into their natural habitat, that a live and let live policy is preferable to war with the bugs. Before Rico uh, blasted, I say kill them all. Well, yeah, I think they can say that, but it's still the government propaganda would seem to state that they do not want a let a, a live and let live policy. Mm -hmm. All right. Round and home now. Four, it's all a propaganda from the future, so the events and news can't be trusted. The news shows them losing over and over and horribly. That's not standard fascist propaganda messaging. The last scene with them declaring they will continue fighting and will win can be considered that, but the entire movie shows the entire species losing. So that might be just to get new citizens to fight for humanity since a war for the species at that point. At no point is there a draft or mandatory conscription. You can say that being a citizen requires service is unfair, but before it being a war for survival, a two-year term is very, very, very minimal time to serve. We don't even have that for our volunteer force. So yeah, at the time of war, volunteering, you know that two-year is more of a suggestion, but you can't say that be before, and the movie started before the war. So many people see this film over and over and don't connect the dots. I hope you read this and consider the film differently. I can sort of see their point of view, but I do feel like also that it's like, they don't force you to, but yeah, if you want to have the right to vote and have the right to have the number of children you want to have, it, it does sort of force you to. And it's, you know, you're saying it's not propaganda, but they're showing them lose over and over again to show, look how brutal these bugs are and we have to defeat them and they're this evil species. You know, it, it it's still a form of propaganda in a way. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I agree with that. I think also like... I have no idea what I was going to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. You can cut that if you want. You don't have to. It's fine. I own it. I'll just cut the pause. I'll still have you make it an ass yourself for a second there. <laughs> That's great. That's okay. perfect. Um, let me get to some emails now. We have just a couple. Uh, first, we have first one in a while, Trevor, saying hello again. Oh, hi, Trevor. Trevor says, currently listening to the latest episode. Quick note, because I'm going to forget if I don't send it now. You mentioned Dakota Fanning in Equalizer 3 with Denzel. It should be noted this is a reunion from their time on the 2004 movie Man on Fire, which could be a good episode for you guys to do. Okay, back to listening to you guys. Haha. -ha. Congrats on one year, by the way. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Happy and you're back. Welcome home. We'll add Man on Fire to our, our list of movies recommended by listeners that we've done a very poor job of getting to. So we'll have to get to them at some point. Yes, eventually. Now we've got one from Scotty Cameron on The Cat in the Hat. Okay. Hey, Dylan and Gab. Great show as always. The Cat in the Hat was the first new release I had seen in a theater because I was a huge Dr. Seuss fan and he was the Cat in the Hat's creator. I remember loving the movie at the time, but that was also at a point where I thought disliking any Dr. Seuss movie was a crime. Now I'm wiser and older and my feelings towards this movie are colder. I'm done rhyming with excellent timing. Oh my God. I didn't connect that. He was rhyming that whole time. Uh, I, I feel like I've done you a disservice in my reading of that. Yeah. Read it again. Hey, Dylan and Gab, great show as always. The Cat in the Hat was the first new release I had seen in a theater because I was a huge Dr. Seuss fan, and he was the Cat in the Hat's creator. So that... Was that theater and creator? I guess you have to say theater. <laughs> <laughs> creator. I remember loving this movie at the time, but that was also a point where I thought disliking a Seuss movie was a crime. Now I'm wiser and older, and my feelings towards this movie are colder. I'm done rhyming with excellent timing. I did better on the timing for you the second time, but I feel like I, I, I flopped that for you at first, Scotty. I apologize. No, I, uh, yeah, you did. You did mess it up the first time, but I am going to say the rhyming on Scotty's part was not excellent timing. The rhyming was excellent. The timing was poor. Sorry. Uh, you can't blame it all on yourself, Dylan. Thank you. So the cat in the hat boy, <laughs> boy has an interesting place in my childhood and memories. Being someone who had various editions of the book, and who loved watching the original 71 short as a kid, I was amped at the time the movie came out. When the movie came out, I saw it and liked it, got it on DVD and watched repeatedly. I had all the merch for the movie, which weirdly just used, which weirdly just used the cat in the hat from the book and settings and vehicles from the movie. It was at a time when I would love any film featuring a Dr. Seuss character because I also liked the Grinch movie at the time. Now I've come to see both movies are bad. The original story is just the cat visiting the kids on a rainy day to have fun and the fish tells the cat to leave. The whole mother of all messes plot was not in the original book. I do feel like I, I viewed the Grinch much more harshly when I first saw it. And I think now I do have some 
reference for it. I can't believe people don't like The Grinch. I thought it was great. Corey and I watched it this past Christmas. I love I think it. it. I think it was very disliked when it first came out. And I, I, I do think it has very interesting ideas in it to expand on, you know, what we said at the same time with the, about the Cat in the Hat book. You're expanding something that's like made to be like a 15 minute read into an hour yeah. and a half to two hours. Yeah. Oh, I think he's about to say the exact same thing I just said. The problem with adapting Dr. Seuss books into 90 minute movies is you're having to stretch a 12 page children's book to the runtime of a feature length film, which means adding a bunch of stuff that wasn't there. Even the 3D animated Dr. Seuss movies from Horton Hears a Who onward still made the same mistakes as how the Grinch stole Christmas and the Cat in the Hat by adding unnecessary stuff to the story. The Lorax with Danny DeVito was the worst offender of the animated movies by inserting a villain into the story, which undermines the entire purpose of the original story. Cat in the Hat made the worst call by just having random shenanigans pad out the runtime to justify a roughly 90-minute runtime. It's just needlessly convoluted. While neither the Jim Carrey or Benedict Cumberbatch Grinch movies were good, at least they used the extended runtime to add a backstory to why the Grinch hates Christmas and make the climax of him stealing Christmas. Benedict Cumberbatch? Yeah, the, they came out with an animated, another animated Grinch movie. Oh, I, I remember that. Okay. I think it was like 2018 or something like that. Yeah. It's just neither film gave him compelling reasons to hate Christmas. Jim Carrey's Horton Hears a Who made the best call in using the runtime to flesh out Whoville and the Animal Kingdom. Even then, I just prefer the simplified shorts from the 60s and 70s that just tell the stories of the original books in animation. That's probably why Seuss's Widow was fine with more animated adaptations because of how iconic the old cartoons were. I mean, it's just also that they, they weren't trying to be feature length. They're just trying to recreate the book. It's like if somebody yeah. tried to make, you know, uh, my mind goes to Frosty the Snowman because I'm like, that was one of those claymation shorts that they made back in the day, right? Like, if you try and turn well, it wasn't any one claymation, of those... but it was animated. Stop motion, not claymation. No, also not. It was just a cartoon. Yeah. Am I, You're am thinking I of like Rudolph. Yes, You're that's what I'm thinking of... of. Yeah. Oh, Frosty. Yes, Frosty is not one of those. Rudolph uh, Rankin Passon, is that their names? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking Stop. of. It is claymation stop motion. Okay. Um, but those aren't trying to be feature length movies. And if you tried to make Rudolph into like a two hour movie, yeah, it's going to be tough. Yeah. Let's see. Nearing the end here. Yeah. The Dr. Seuss controversy was about some racially insensitive illustrations and his old propaganda and books like If I Ran a Zoo. Seuss's estate withdrew those books because they felt it was something Seuss would have wanted them removed from publication because of the racially insensitive illustrations. They based this on an interview Seuss gave in 1978, where he stated that he regretted using racially insensitive imagery in his World War II propaganda in early books like If I Ran a Zoo and wrote Gordon Hears a Who to atone for that past. Aw, that's nice. That's all, folks. In case I don't see you again, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, Scotty. Very nice. Two more emails here. We've got one from Marcos, which is Mark Aquino. I don't know why. When when you send me an email, it comes out as Marcos, and I'm like, I must enunciate as the words say. <laughs> Subject. The cat in the hat. I was originally going to do another catch-up email, but when I saw the movie you were covering last week and got reminded of some repressed memories from my childhood. <laughs> it was the time with my uncle. No, that's not what it says. It was the time <laughs> with Brian Singer. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> Now, Gab, I understand that this one is a personal favorite of yours, and that's totally fine. We are all free to like whatever we like individually, and that is completely valid. So I hope you can accept that. Personally, I don't like this movie. Far from it. I hate this movie. This was that's the, crazy, but okay. This was the first movie I can remember seeing as a kid that made me realize, oh, movies aren't always good. <laughs> 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 that is, that's a cold line. It's in my top three of movies that I absolutely hate. It's one that I put on a list of movies that sum up everything wrong with Hollywood, seeing as it turns something as whimsical as Dr. Seuss into something crass and unbearable. Huh. It feels like it was put together by people who didn't actually care about the original book. In terms of the writing, they must have deliberately made the wrong choices for the sake of being edgy and to upset people. The movie equivalent of an internet shitpost. You want to make a deliberate shitpost of a movie? Fine. But don't drag the world of Dr. Seuss into it. The film's cynical tone and sense of humor just doesn't go together with Dr. Seuss's style at all. That style can be wild and wacky, yeah, but it's not crude and sardonic like this is. If anything, this feels more like an intentionally mean-spirited parody of Dr. Seuss. No different from the god-awful spoof movies that came out during the late 2000s. You know the ones I'm talking about. The scary movie sequels, epic movie, date movie, meet the Spartans, disaster movie. 
I mean, mm-hmm. a random Paris Hilton cameo wouldn't have felt out of place in any of those mm-hmm. movies. That is true. <laughs> Dad, who's that girl? Eh, I'll explain it to you when you're older. <laughs> Son, we're going to learn about the birds and the bees. This movie's called One Night in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Ew. Now, I'll try to be fair. From a technical standpoint, the production design is admittedly top-notch, given that this was the directorial debut of legendary production designer Bo Welch, who I don't blame directly for how this turned out. And the makeup effects, as garish as they are, were objectively well executed, along with the costume work, as well as the musical score by David Newman. Again, I don't blame Bo Welch for this, as the movie was clearly mangled by studio interference. This is not a movie watch before you die, in my opinion. Shocking to hear. Yeah, I can't believe it. It's a movie to avoid at all costs and not waste your time with. I don't blame Seuss's daughter, Audrey Geisel, for making it so that there will be no more live-action film versions of her father's books from that point on. I would do the same thing if I saw my father's work being butchered like this. And I with think that, that's fair. Sorry, I, go ahead. I, I think he's pretty aggrieved by this. I, I, yeah. I bet that even she didn't feel that his work was butchered um, to the extent that you did. Although I would love to know if Audrey Geisel was like, Movies can be bad. What have they done? <laughs> oh my god, they can be bad. I do love picturing like a child having this revelation. <laughs> yeah. And with that, I'm pretty sure that I am now Gab's least favorite listener. Nope, absolutely not true. <laughs> <laughs> Here's hoping I can get back on your good graces soon enough, i.e. sending money to you through Venmo. Yep, exactly. You know the deal. As always, despite our differing opinions on this specific movie, you still rule, Gab. And Dylan, never stop reminding her of that, and I'll see you on the Batwagon. Yours, Mark. So nice. No, Mark, I think that's fair. Listen, not every listen, I knew that it was a hot take. Like, make no mistake, I did not think that I was in the majority of people here when I said that I like this movie. Um, however, I think you were very respectful about it. And also, like, yeah, it's not a great movie, but it's got some great one-liners. Sometimes you, know. you take a shot with a movie that you love. Just because you love yeah. it doesn't mean everybody has to either. Yeah. It was a bold choice to go with Dr. Seuss. Ha ha ha. Good one. That's rhyming timing. Okay. <laughs> uh, our last email comes from Keen Machine. Greetings, Dylan and Gab. I thought about doing a rhyme, but I'm not sure I could match the high bar Dylan has set here. Gab was yeah. quite correct. I did love that. Gab was also incorrect in calling Dr. Seuss a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> damn Thank it goodness. He actually yeah i made, mean i'm happy about that he actually made anti-axis propaganda for the war effort and challenged america's seeming disregard towards the early plight of the jewish people trying to escape germany's new regime but yes some of his depictions of other races during that stint of work are disheartening and certainly would not be acceptable today still his book's messages have always been about kindness social responsibility and doing the right thing so i like to believe he grew as a person I have a soft spot for the Dr. Seuss cinematic universe. Of course, the DSCU. <laughs> Plus, I was in the musical Seussical back in my theater days. Have I mentioned I did theater? Of course theater? you were. <laughs> and it was an amazing time. It does an excellent job of connecting a bunch of his stories into one larger plot and has fantastically fun music. It's a very funny show. I know nothing about the Seussical musical, but that sounds like a clever idea to combine multiple stories rather than try and stretch one. It's really cute. Although it's not a movie to watch before you die, I'm glad Gab chose this film because of her personal love for it. We all have those films or shows that are married to our nostalgia and feel like home. Cue the Batman the Animated Series theme. <laughs> Looking forward to the return of Corey and, as always, Scotty's insightful mail. Also, can't wait to see a Broadway show someday when Gab buys us all tickets. Keep it keen, Keen Machine. Cute. Aw, thanks, Keen. That is all the mail that we have for this week. And you know what? It was a lot of good mail. It was. It was very positive, very uplifting. And very informational about Dr. Seuss and about Starship Troopers. So thank you for all the info. Thank you. And uh, my apologies to the late Dr. Seuss for the accusation of Nazihood. Also apologize to Dr. Seuss. One and the same. And now we can get back to our verdicts for Big with Corey. Let's go. Do or do not. There is no try. The guilty will be punished. Sentence. I'll go first, I guess, because I've probably seen this movie the most times, but I will call Big a movie to watch before you die. I think it does it does everything you want it to do well. And I think the things that we would say it doesn't do well are sort of nitpicky. 
because the entire time you are along for the ride with Josh, I always feel that way. You never are thinking actively of Susan as a diddler. I feel like the first time you're seeing this movie. And I think that it makes you laugh. And it's a comedy first and foremost. And it does a good job of making you laugh and putting out the message that Corey summed up so well during the What's It About? I'll agree with you. I think anytime you watch a Tom Hanks movie, what you're really watching is a masterclass in performance. And Tom Hanks is incredibly convincing as a 13 year old in a grown man's body. I think the other two things you watch this movie for are number one, um, the piano scene, which is spectacular. And number two, the loft in New York City in Soho that he lives in with all of the arcade games and the vending machine and the trampoline. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that I said to Corey when I found out he had never watched this movie was, I've said to you, we could get the loft from Big, and you've just smiled and nodded. So what the fuck? Um, I feel like I reference that loft all the time. A-plus movie. It's an easy watch. It's great. Uh, definitely a movie to watch before you die. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with both of you guys. It's definitely a movie to watch before you die. I think they nailed it with the... Uh, it looks like the grass is greener on the other side as an adult, but just enjoy being a kid as long as you can. And uh, the last few movies that you guys have had on the show have just been like, they just remind me of going to the movies back in the day. And there's like these movies with these simple messages that you don't have to read into or be sitting there looking for something to be offended about. You can just genu just genuinely enjoy the movie. So I loved it. And it is a movie to watch before you die because it's a Tom Hanks movie. Watch all his movies. Fantastic. Amen. We all agree. And honestly, yeah. Corey segues so well into the movie that we're going to be talking about next week because it's another movie that I feel like is such a simple concept. But we'll talk about it more next week. Um, the movie's going to be Joyride from 2001 because there's also apparently a Joyride that came out like this year. But Interesting. Let's say the things that we say at the end of this thing. First, you can listen to Corey Has a Podcast. Which... Well, you can listen to old episodes of Corey Has a Podcast, but Corey no longer has a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's leave the entertaining to the entertainers, all right? <laughs> Corey had a podcast. You can send us an email at movies to watch before you die at gmail.com, or you can send us a voice message also at movies to watch before you die at gmail.com, or on anchor.fm slash movies to watch. Gab, anything else you want to say at the end of this bad boy? Just Venmo me, please, and keep praying about this NSYNC reunion, guys. It's really important to me. Keep praying for NSYNC and pray that I have the money to afford the tickets. <laughs> yes. I will I will buy a house just to take out a second mortgage on the house. Thanks for coming on, Corey. Thank you for having me. That was great. You're the best. Thank you, Corey. You can no longer be a very special guest, Corey. You've been on too many times. We demote you to guest now. <laughs> yeah, just guest. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you next week. Bye-bye. I'm not sure we should do this yet. Do what? Come on. I mean, I like you and uh, I want to spend the night with you. Do you mean sleep over? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. But I get to be on top.